thanks thanks a lot uh i want to welcome you all to start the uh, sql start event if i'm not wrong this is the 10th anniversary and that's really impressive milestone uh, my name is uh, zoran barak i'm principal data architect at since seven i'm uh, living and working in new zealand and i'm currently in Auckland at 7 p.m here so uh, close to the end of the day uh this is my contact details on the first slide uh you can contact me can contact me anytime, uh, ask questions, I will do my best to give my answers. Uh, today, the topic is going to be how to choose the optimal VM size and storage configuration for your SQL Server and Azure VM. So it's an infrastructure as a service option in Azure. Uh, I would like to mention the partners. I probably mispronounced some names, but I will try my best. Uh, DevMarsh, it's a community network dedicated to software development. Marsh Polytechnic University and the first Italian user group dedicated to Microsoft SQL Server. So thank you all for making this possible. So this is the agenda for today. It's looked massive, but it's really not. So uh, we'll talk, we'll scratch the surface for some of the stuff. It's really important to mention them all uh, because if you start using the infrastructure the service VMs on Azure, you're gonna end up using all of those things at one point. So it's really important to understand them to pick the right choice, the best, best VM for you in your SQL workload. First of all, I'm gonna ask that all of you attending the session already know uh, and understand uh, that infrastructure as a service and the VM is your uh, target choice. Because there is another option on the Azure, you can go only platform as a service and choose something else, uh, which is managed by Azure. But uh, I will not go to that side because I don't have enough time for that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna concentrate on uh, guessing that you will understand uh, that infrastructure as a service is your best choice. So validate your workload. That's the first step before you move from let's say from dedicated mode or uh, if you have a host of hypervisor summarized else you want to go to Azure. I will guess that. Uh, uh, you already have some workload, some SQL LTP traffic there. So you need to use the counters to measure workload requirements. You need to use workload performance indicators to find your targeted IOPS and targeted troop. And it's really important. So we're gonna say some some a uh, few words, few sentences around this just to explain how it works and uh, what is the performance counters in the back you may use. So the, there is a few of those counters really important, like IOPS, tribute latency. So and there is a performance option you can choose to find your current value you may have on your dedicated machine. So the latency, latency is actually uh, your uh, time necessary to complete one I request. You can use from performance, you have average disk second per read and average disk second per write. Uh, that's actually giving you latency. Uh, but bear in mind, bear in mind, moving to the Azure, uh, if you had some latency like uh, one, two milliseconds on, on dedicated one, you cannot quite expect the same results on Azure uh, because Azure is treat latency a little bit differently. Latency is just, not just on the drive, like in this example, you may have latency on the whole uh, experience, getting that data presented to your final uh, client, user, and application. So the whole concept of that latency is a little bit different on Azure. Uh, but uh, let's first talk about this one. This is attached to the drive, so it's high latency. The second one is IOPS. It's actually a number of requests uh, issued to your storage per second. So you have a disk reads and disk writes there. Uh, you really need to be careful with this because you need to find the right IOPS measure for your Azure, Azure SQL Server or Azure VM. SQL Server, because uh, choosing the VM size on Azure is based on your IOPS on the throughput. So it's really important to understand what your current workload and and set up and collect your performance baseline. That's really important prior to structure as a service. Second one is the size of your IO. It's actually uh, it's your allocation unit size or block size. It's measured with uh, performance and two columns. You have its average disk byte per read and average disk bytes uh, per write. And this uh, size in the, on the volume level, when you format your drive at 64K, which is the recommended practice by Microsoft, you're going to have a 64K size. 
The next one, and uh, same as I have seen mentioned, it's all of those machines on the VM uh, and all of the different sizes that are related uh, and IOPS. So uh, the throughput is amount of data read from a, uh, or write this per second. So you have again two two counters there, this read by per second and this write by per second. Um, important for the throughput. You don't need to go too deep to understand this. There is a basic math behind this is uh, IOPS time, IOPS size, what is your IOPS size, block size, or, or allocation size, whatever you want to call. It's equal to throughput. So it's a good example. It's 10,000 IOPS. Let's say you have two P30, 5,000 each. That's the 10,000 IOPS in, in simple resilience stripe across the drive. And uh, you have 64K uh, for mature uh, drive. NTFS drive uh, and uh, your, your volume actually, and, and uh, if you calculate that, you're going to have like around 600 for the next few seconds. That's going to be a, a per drive, let's say one people for the half of that. So uh, it's really important to uh, to understand all this so you can actually measure your current workload. The next one. Uh, the next one, this is like a guideline, let's say guideline, we can call it like that. Uh, it's it's not something you need to follow, it's just something we're going to go and scan through. And uh, since we're going to mention all of those things in the later slides, how you can collect, how you can uh, measure, how you can decide, choose the right target, choose the right drive, and so on and so on. So the first one is collect types requirements. You have a log data and temp data. Those are really three really important concepts. Okay. Dedicated one on VM uh, infrastructure, Azure, or anything like that. Anywhere you go in the SQL workload, you need to think about log data and temp data. You need to choose your VM size can fit your IOPS requirements, IOPS and the throughput. But as I said, IOPS is something you need to aim because throughput depends on the, on the block size as well. For a temp DB, you need to choose the VMs having the F, uh, ephemeral drives, SSD drives, those are locally attached drives. Uh, those are temporary drives. So once you reboot machines, uh, everything there is going to be gone. Uh, when they allocate them, they allocate machines, so everything there is going to be gone. But that's brilliant, uh, which you can use for your time DB. Uh, choose the VM supporting the premium SSDs. Uh, use the SSDs less than four terabytes, but uh, I would use uh, from P30. You have to explain later on why. But less than four terabytes because the four terabytes and above then doesn't have support for cache. Use multiple disks and stripe them together. That's a simple resilience on the storage space on your on your uh, virtual drive uh, because it's kind of multiple your your tube and the IOPS as well. If you need a higher write throughput, use ultra disk or write restoration. But we're gonna talk about the write restoration on, uh, because it's, it's supported just only M series. We're going to show you example how I'm going to show you example how it works like right. Monitor performance to see if uh, there is any IOPS bottlenecks. Uh, and if there is a bottleneck, you uh, then consider moving uh, your data file or just LDF files to uh, alter this. But if, uh, if you have a bottleneck, that maybe it's going to be necessary to have a sub millisecond uh, latency on the data drive as well. Uh, now we're going to those VM categories VM series. So now we're going to see what is the offer from uh, from Microsoft. We're going to talk about the compute size, naming convention, how to recognize the VM by the name, uh, constraint CPUs, which is really important, and the best uh, recommended option if you use memory optimized CPUs. So Azure VM compute size options. On the right side, you have you can see two pictures. It says filter type and it says filter family and so on and so on. Uh, why I'm showing you this? Because if you go to the portal, you can find those filters and actually filter your VMs, not showing you all possibilities or all options you have because you have almost 400 different virtual machines currently. You, you can't go and scan through all of them. You kind of need to aim. What is the best for your SQL workload? And uh, I would recommend you going memory optimized, but for some specific usage, some somebody, some people using the storage optimized, or uh, let's say they want extremely high throughput or anything like that, 
more high performance compute if you want uh, uh, some some uh, really uh, some really high level uh, execution CPU level use and uh, if you have some additional uh, network requirements and so on so on may use this here in the slide you have a uh, six groups but there is a eight grouping types in including with this on the slide what you see entry level and the burstable we're going to talk about the burstable and the burst disks later on in a slide uh, but this is this is like uh, the main one and you can understand i don't want to go through each one of those because it's going to take too much time but obviously compute optimized high cpu to the ratio general purpose to general purpose is not built for a for the workload uh, higher performance compute compute is Memory optimized, a really good choice for a SQL workload. I'm personally using most uh, E series and M series. Oh, next one. Uh, so, this is the purpose of this slide is actually to help you to recognize uh, uh, by the look at the name what would be the best option for you. Let's let's say you filter out and you just filter out those uh, uh, which are uh, memory optimized. Now you're gonna see all those different naming uh, with different uh, different letters in uh, like E thirty two sixteen ES underscore V four. So how to understand when you see that one? Uh, bear in mind that just uh, the series actually represent exact. Uh, for example, D and this for our local temp DB is present, but uh, some of the series, although they have that, they're not putting that D in the name. But I think that all they're going to have that kind of specified uh, all the time. So the first one is the family uh, family series. So it's like you can see two examples on the right side. It's M16 MS and E32 16DS and Story 4. So M is actually the family of the machine. Then if you have any uh, specialized, like uh, something specially that VM, which uh, differenti differentiate that VM from any other in that series, you will have that mark, but usually you have like uh, in E32 uh, dash 16. That 16 is the constraints. So some of those series like that E32 have constraints. I'm not going too deep on this one because next slide is talking about that. I just want to point out that. But uh, some other features which I'm usually uh, like to see it's a D that this drive but bear in mind there is some uh, vm sizes they actually have the disk there and it's not presented with the, from the vm name uh, so the m is a memory intensive uh isolated if you need uh, for some security reasons or anything like that separated from other machines and rack, you can have isolated size not cost you more. and that's that's actually the premium storage capable machines this is very important because uh you want to have that premium storage we're going to talk about the premium storage in the next slide, but that's going to be it's it's usually the best option and uh, let's say uh, uh, not cheapest, but if you compare it with the ultra disks, yes, it's way cheaper and it's good enough for your workload for the data files uh, and, and LDF files. So as well, bear in mind that there is some new sizes without that attribute, but still have the uh, support. So uh, the rest of it is kind of like self-explanatory. It's uh, hibernation capable. We all know what that. AMD, it's a CPU version you can use. Uh, low memory, tiny memory. And uh, there is a LDMA. And LDMA is one of those machines I mentioned the previous slide uh, with high CPU compute option. Uh, that's high performance computing of sizes feature a network interface for this LDME for actually remote direct memory access. Uh, as well, I think some N series as well, uh, they have a designated R, they actually supporting this. Uh, this is just an uh, addition on the stand to the standard uh, Azure that Ethernet is it's available uh, like in every other VM. This is just the addition to it. We mentioned constrained CPUs. This is example, and this is example for E series V4, and this is example for E32. So E32 DS, you can see here, 
that's the the main the baseline the family of uh, of SVM is actually E and that's thirty two saying I have thirty two CPUs and I'm supporting the temporary drive I'm supporting uh, and I'm V4 version that V4 as well as V4 and I will explain why. But this is one of my favorite series, not just this particular one, any constrained one, because what's happening here, although you keep all uh, RAM gigabytes of RAM 256 and the data disk you can attach is max IOPS is uh, 51,000 and uh, temporary storage is more than one pair size and supported in large, you have less CPU. Everything else stays the same, but less CPU means you're paying less for your license. Uh, because license quarter actually is uh, charged by the CPU number uh, in general. So uh, you're getting the best and uh, let's say the same amount of power on everything else, but you're paying less for your for your license. So that's that's a really a really big deal. And you can see it's like uh, I think it's a half and a quarter. So uh, depends which one you choose. So those are SQL VM memory optimized series, which is I really recommend those to use uh, because anything else like uh, if you compare with the storage optimized and compare with uh, any lower level like general, it's not going to give you that throughput. It's not going to give you that IOPS. It's not going to give you that performance. And you're going to have eventually if you have a uh, quite peak like workload which is really higher than usual, you're going to have issue with that. So you need eventually you need to move. To, to the one of those options. This is just an example. So uh, I, I put those slides here, and I, you can see I put old E60 V3 example, and I put that for a reason, and I will tell you why. Uh, some I know that some people uh, use a reservation for a drive for VMs to save the money, which is completely understandable. But bear in mind, Microsoft uh, is adding those new machines all the time, literally regularly. And usually those new series give you more power for the same cost. So this is this is just an example of this particular series. So I can see that series here on the list and my uh, in my uh, Azure portal because it's observed. Otherwise, you wouldn't see that if it was one right now because uh, that series is not available anymore. But uh, if you compare this V3 and V4, V4 is using the new Cascad Lake and it's, uh, it's working between 2.6, 2.7 to 3.7 boost. I think the CPU. It's a fast thread. It's a fast CPU. Every 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 CPU there that is going to give you a power. And that IOPS is actually your IOPS depends on the thread thread in the back. So uh, old one is using I think 2.3 and uh, up to 3.3 or something like that. It's uh, it's old as well. So uh, there is a difference there. And I would I would really recommend that. And as well, what I would recommend that always using uh, when you when you're spinning those machines, I recommend that always use uh, uh, each from a marketplace because a bunch of those stuff we're gonna talk during the session is gonna be pre-configured for you properly, so you don't need to think later on if you did something wrong. That as well, is quite important. So the next one is uh, really important as well because we're going to talk about the storage options and configuration. So we're going to talk about what are the options, storage options on Azure, uh, what are ultra disks are, and the important part, really important part, storage pools, storage spaces, volumes, and the block size in the lead and the uh, columns. Uh, the last one is going to be the uh, user interface that's uh, to the manager app configuration and storage service, uh, file and storage and configuration using the uh, uh, graphic user interface within those, so it's just going to be an example how to do that. Azure VM storages. So you can see there we have a four different options, uh, which we're mostly using, but I would just point out that first two are actually serious option. Standard SSD you might use for some kind of a dev environment or something like that, but definitely not production. I am not even considering the last one. But uh, in terms of disk roles in Azure, there is three disk roles. That's a data disk, OS disk, and temporary disk. 
those three laws, when I say data disk, I mean any data like LDF, MDFIs, but this is data disk. So those three laws are really important. Those three laws, usually I'm always suggesting premium SSD, because that's a production and performance sensitive workload option. Uh, that's a, you, you can't consider that as a local attach because this is still remote disk, but still has a sort of type of disk. And uh, it's not like your dedicated one. But the temporary disk, local attaches, is the, as I already mentioned, this is, the, this is the temporary disk. So when you're choosing the VM size, you need specifically choose those ones. I'm recommending that. So it's your choice. But choose those ones having this uh, E in the name. So you know that it's going to have this uh, uh, ephemeral drive. So it's going to be the temporary drive attached. You can point out your MDB. Uh, definitely don't point out anything else because uh, if you delegate this machine, it's going to be done. Yeah, bear in mind, here we are talking about the premium SSD size P30, P40, and P50. If necessary, I'm going just with P30, and sometimes P40 depends on the number of drives I can add to a specific machine and the number of files IPS I need to reach. Because sometimes if you need high apps, you need to add like 16 drives or something like that. Some VM sizes do not allow you to add more than 16. I think it's around 32 mostly for uh, 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 memory optimized. Uh, everything below 4 tera have the ability to have a cache host on the dry level, which is really, really important. And I will show you why. Uh, bear in mind that there is a something called a uh, disk first ability. It's attached to a premium and SSD, standard SSD. Everything which is below the uh, ha uh, half tera, it's 500 gigs and below. So uh, those drives have that option and it's uh, called uh, credit-based bursting. It's enabled by defaults on legible drive disks and it's worked like uh, when you have that credit, uh, as soon as you need a uh, higher apps for a zero to half an hour, you can actually push that apps and uh, you'll have faster drive at the point. Now there is another option in preview for uh, higher and bigger drives, uh, which will include the P30 and the uh, uh, P40 and so on. It's called on-demand bursting, but that's not free, so you need to pay for it. Uh, it's basically basically mean that, uh, for example, one terabyte P30. Uh, Provisioning like uh, 5,000 IOPS when this burst is enabled to the disk, the workload can issue uh, up to 40,000 IOPS and uh, 1,000. Like the limit is 200, 200 meg, but if you have a bursting, it can go like five times more. So it's quite powerful, but it's not cheap, and you need to and you need to enable. And as well, bear in mind that uh, ephemeral drives as well are an option for OS your uh, OS system drives if you like. It's for specific cases. Uh, for example, we have a stateless workloads uh, and uh, all the session data stay with, uh, with the client, so you can actually afford to reboot that and uh, re-image re the drive and so on. Ultra disks. This specific example here is for uh, uh, the highest you can get. It's 160,000 IPS. It's uh, 2,000 megs per uh, I uh, uh, um, want disk. You can use the shared drives uh, for this one, Max Series 5. So you can share disk uh, across the fellow class with everyone. It's, it's possible to share different instances. So, how that actually works, you can attach the Azure Managed Disk to multiple machines simultaneously. So, that's how it works. Uh, disk size note. I put the note there because you will charge the same rate no matter what you're using for the full size of drives. So you're gonna Drive with five, five, uh, 256 is going to be charged to 56. It's not cheap. It's really powerful. It's a uh, milliseconds latency. So, um, yeah, for a um, kind of high uh, intense workload, it's suggested. Bear in mind as well that uh, if you have any redundancy option here, uh, you need to choose the proper availability zone because. Uh, not every region supports every VM size with ultra disks. So, but still, you have a major benefit that uh, 
you can change dynamically change performance of SSD. So it's brilliant for high intense workload. It's not going for a um, Box size interleaving comes. Really be careful with this because you need to set up this properly. As I already said at the beginning of the session, if you go with the marketplace and choose machines from a marketplace, I wouldn't expect any issue with this uh, because it's going to be already presetted. We're going to see one example later on, but uh, block size is actually your uh, allocation unit size. It's uh, when you format your volume, when you format your drives, and NTFS, you're adding that size to what you want. Uh, so, what we suggested for SQL is 64K. Uh, but you can understand if it's bigger than that for, a, for a, let's say, um, I'm not sure, the fragmented drives, like, like some, something like that, like uh, backups or uh, even index rebuild or um, warehouse uh, analytics workload. Uh, bigger size is better, but we are talking about OLTP here. So 64K because our SQL read our data in 64K is because you already know 8K time, times 8K, 64K extent. So that's what we're looking for. And bear in mind, small block size have high high ops with low throughput, while large block size results in high throughput with low ops. So sharp size, interleave size. If you want to accomplish maximum performance, you need to equalize that with your RSI. Why is that? Why is that really important? If your RSI exceeds the interleave size, that, interleave, that, that write, for example, that write is going to be split to multiple stripes, turning one write to multiple writes, and that's going to reduce your performance. So, those block size in the stripe size or interleaf size keep 64k both. So you can see here it's 64. The number of counts. So again, if you go with the uh, imaging from marketplace, you know, don't need to worry about this. It's going to be like that already. It's going to if you add five drives, the number of counts is going to be five. So uh, just a pure example, the number of counts need to be actually ex exactly the same as your uh, as your uh, number of drives in that uh, storage space. Storage space is actually a virtual drive. So what means that. Uh, Assume that you create a simple low resilience storage space. So it's a, it's a stripe drives across 10 drives, 10 disks. Each disk is capable of 150 megs uh, sequential throughput. Uh, creating a simple space, you uh, for a one, just for a one with one column, it's going to be it's going to be 150. So no matter you have 10 and you should have like 1500. No, you're going to have 150. Add two, you have a 300. Add four columns, you have a four times that. So four times 150. Uh, so you need to have an equal number to so utilize all those drives you have in your storage, storage space, your virtual drive. Let's move on. This is how it looks like. So create one or more storage pools, create one or more virtual drives to storage space on that storage pool, and create one or more volumes. So this is how it looks like. If you go to the image file and choose and uh, Generate your uh, drive for a LDF or data file for a uh, 10 dB. You're going to have already uh, like this. So you have a one storage pool, having all those drive in, or two depends what you have there. But this is how it looks like. This is, the, this is the drive from a portal below. You see the drive's name. You see that's premium SSD locally redundant. You see the size. Those are P30. So the max IOPS is 5000, the max truth is 200. So if you, if, you, if you take first two and say, let's say, this is going to be my Sorry, this is going to be my storage space, uh, virtual drive, and I'm going to have two columns. I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have 64k on that for interleave, 64k on that on the block size. And I have 10,000 IOPS because I have two because it's going to be simple uh, resilience. It's going to be striped, and I am going to have 400 throughput. This is what you're looking for. Those two are going to belong to the one storage pool. There is a multiple option you can do with this uh, for, a, for a storage space resilient type. So you can use a simple, which is stripe data across the physical disk, mirror, stripe two or three copies across the physical disk, and parity, which is actually a hot spare. Uh, it helps protect you from uh, one single drive failure. So this is how that looks like using the file and storage service user interface. 
<coughs> so, sorry. The first one is storage pools. You can see there is a storage pool names. So there is a there is a, a virtual disk or storage space, and there are drives on the right. You can see the drives belonging to. There is an option as well. This is for a single standing single machine, but uh, uh, you can do that for if you have a multiple machines in the industrial cluster, you can put shared storage pool. Uh, so you can, this is the cluster in the storage. Uh, you can add to uh, all of those things, all of those machines belong to them. It's pretty storage. If you're using the image from a marketplace, you're going to have all this already prepared as opposed to that. If you're not, you can use this tool and create. But I don't think, I don't recall, I'm not using all the everyday this, but I don't think you can change the interleave there. It's going to be, the interleave size is going to be um, 256 by default, I think. So, but what you can do, you can use the, you can use the uh, PowerShell and you can pass a uh, name for a, what is going to be a storage pool name. You passing all the drives available here, but you can specify the drive name if you want. Then you, then you on this storage pool, you're creating this virtual drive or storage space, and then you put the resilience. I recommend simple because it's already redundant storage. But if you want additional security, you can do mirror. It's going to have a multiple drive, uh, multiple drives. You need to be like if you want mirror two drives, you need to have four, and you have a two columns for that one because it's mirror. Uh, the size of the drive, you can specify the size and uh, or not like you can use provisioning type. It's a thin or fixed. So if it's a fixed, you're going to put the fixed size. If it's thin, it's going to use everything available. Uh, you additional thing, you can't use the, you can't use this uh, the storage space for your OS. Uh, it's not, it's not possible. And uh, if you change anything here, please stop SQL services in the operation. Is they can cause the better disruption. This is the VM caching and disrupting uh, section. So after you choose the right size, you need to understand your I limits on the on the VM level, and you need to stand I limits on the on the disk level, and the, how you can kind of interfere with that, and how you can speed up if uh, any capping happens. So I I, I talk about this uh, screen. Uh, through a few sessions, few slides. So this is actually when you when you're using the image from uh, from marketplace, you're gonna end up uh, going to the SQL configuration and the disk configuration and OLTP uh, uh, OLTP option uh, because you can use like the general OLTP and the warehouse, but it's definitely like how you separating LDF MDF file and uh, uh, TMDB. So this is how it looks like. Uh, so you have. Uh, uh, you choose the this type. This is the premium SSD. So I choose the P30. That's uh, 5,000 IPS per drive and 200 throughput per drive. So I have five disks. That's uh, 10,000, 25,000, and size is five tera. For LDF, I put two drives. It's multiplying that as well and premium SSD as well. I can't see the uh, uh, 10 dB here, but uh, usually it's just 10 dB and uh, it's pointing all the 10 dB files going to point to the D drive. It's FML drive, so you um, don't need to set up anything there. You just need to understand uh, the size of the drive, and uh, there is a limit on that drive as well. So uh, on the right side, why I choose this screen is uh, you see the series. There is E6416 underscore V3, uh, 4250 RAM, 80,000 IOPS uncached. The throughput is 1,200. This throughput is more than that. This throughput is 1,400. So you're gonna say, see the warning if you do something like that. It's gonna say, oh, okay, uh, you added drives with the more throughput than what your uh, VM can handle. But that shouldn't be like, oh, okay, I need to change. I need to add more. I need to change VM size because this happening now. You need to understand that there is an option, a host cache option in those drives, which uh, boost up your throughput anyhow. You're gonna see that in the future slide. So this is what I'm talking. This is the host VM caching and I limit. So there is an option called max cached uh, storage throughput IPS and megabytes, uh, megabits per second, megabits per second, and uh, max uncached. So there is a difference. This is the M series, so it's not the huge difference, but with uh, uh, E32 ES and 64 ES, it's going to be quite a big difference. So you, you uncached throughput is 10,000. Your cache throughput 
is 20,000. So I will show you later on example how much that puts this give you. Uh, one thing, uh, I, I can't repeat this enough, but if you're changing read only, read only to none or anything like that, all those host cache options, please, please stop your, your SQL services because it really can cause the corruption. One off topic situation, even if you work with a Windows Server cluster and you want to validate your drives or validate your cluster, if you have those uh, storage pools with multiple drives on all those machines joining the cluster, uh, when you validate that and your SQL is having transactions on, it may happen that without one of your drives for the machine, it's going to crap your database. So for all of those changes you're doing, please stop your uh, SQL. This is how this caching is look like. This is the read-only cache. <clears throat> you see more options here. You see none and write accelerator and read-only write. Usually you won't see that. This is just for I'm serious. Usually just the read-only read write and none. But yeah, let's let's talk about the first scenario. First scenario, when the read is performed, the data is available in cache. Uh, the cache returns a request data. There is no need to be some of this. That read is counted towards the cache limit. When read is performed on the second scenario and not available in the cache, the read is transferred to the disk. Then disk surface to the both cache and the VM, and this read is counted both to can cache and cached. Obviously. Then the third scenario is uh, when write is performed, the write has to be written to the both cache and the disk before it's completely complete. This is counted both. Why I'm saying that, you're going to see uh, this is the read only, this is the read write. The only difference here, everything is the same except that part, because uh, when writing with host caching is read and write, the write light only need to be write in the host cache to be considered possible complete. That is the lazy write, and that's the reason why I said be careful because I'm not recommending this read write for LDFR because it really can corrupt the database. That's the reason why this can ha happen. Uh, for example, even even system drives, C drive, by default, if you didn't turn off, that has read write cache. It's read write host cache enabled. So uh, I don't keep my my system databases there as well. Move them because uh, if you if you not gracefully shut down this VM, it can corrupt, it do corruption and corrupt your data. Some data there, uh, and even if you change the size, you can do that. So this is the uh, Azure VMI limits. On the left side, uh, for the first example, there is no read-only host caching. And bear in mind, when you enable this read-only host caching, it gives you the higher IOPS than the disk limit. Just remember that. So the first one doesn't have that. So the app sending uh, 50,000, uh, uh, yeah, 1,000, no, it's 50,000, yeah, 50,000 requests. Uh, what VM is doing because uncached is 10,000 limit, he can't handle 15. He's handled 10. He's sending uh, one third to each. All those drives can handle that without any issue because it's, they can handle uncached 5,000. They're returning that back. So you have a cap on the VM because the request is 15, you have 10. So in this case, what you're going to say, oh, damn it, I need to go with a bigger VM. But it's not always the case. You need to understand your workload. So you just, you just measure and see what is actually happening. Do you see any performance issue? Do your clients see any performance issue? Which is really important. So, or you just, because it hit the cap at one point, or I just need to do that. That's not always the reason. The same machine, completely same machine, different scenario. You have a cache, a read-only cache uh, enabled. Post caching enabled. So you send 15, uh, and just to bear in mind, ignore the throughput in this case, because we just want to handle lives, throughput, any kind of defense, life size, and so on. Uh, 15,000, uh, 15,555, each 555 returning back, you have 15,000. It's the same machine. It's just the difference is that you enabled the cache on it. So this is the this guy limit. Let's say that you have P10, 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 which is uh, max is uh, uncached. This is uncached example. Max is 500 and 400 
and so on. So you send you send ten thousand your VM uncashed ten thousand yeah easily one third to each they can return just five hundred we have a cap on a on a VM side. So what I'm recommending that's the reason why I'm saying like go with P thirty and P forty. You can do the calculation on that. How many to get the same same uh, disk size and uh, similar apps or even high with P30 and check the cost. Check the cost. Use the calculator, online calculator. Check the cost and see. You're gonna end up in similar cost. There's gonna be a big difference, and you're gonna have better throughput, better better high number of apps, and so on, so on. Right, accelerated. This is available just for M series. You can see that I had M series mostly for those examples. LS, which is storage optimized, one P32 or 16 and one L16MS. Those three machines I was testing in this for the session. So uh, it's it's a capability of uh, M series. You speed up uh, your drive, so it's really good for our latency. If you need our latency, it's really low. And it's usually used for a write against a, a log file. So those dri those drives holding your log file that faster. If you can't accomplish with this one, you need to go with those drives. But this is the uh, first choice for me because it's uh, it, it's not uh, you're not paying for this feature. It's going with them series. Bear in mind uh, that uh, there is a no, you can't do the snapshot. For a backup scheme, during the backup, for example, if you have a write accelerator enabled disk during the backup, Azure backup service automatic exclude those write accelerator enabled disk uh, from attached to your VM backup. And bear in mind, if you have, uh, we're going with 64K, this is going to be, of course, in that limit, but uh, below 512K, is, uh, those drives can be uh, taking this accelerated path. And as well, for this M series, there is a limit. Uh, I have two drives, so I have a, that's the max for M16 MS. But if you go up for with the series, you're going to have more drives. You can actually enable this. I, I recommend to enable more than right accelerator for the other. Benchmarking. <clears throat> so we cover most of the things, but now let's see how that behaves actually when we enable that host caching. Checking those uh, camping on the disk level, on the on the VM level, and so on. Benchmarking is a process where we trying to replicate or simulate the different workloads using your application or not, or using just some tool, because we are testing the drive and the VM, uh, and trying to compare and read those performance for each workload. You can use different tools. Really, you can use the, the Crystal Mark tool or uh, this tool or any other storage you may use uh, HammerDB and just do the counters and measure that or HammerDB and use the uh, portal Azure portal to see how it's behaving all is acceptable as long as you understand how to read those results so the first one is uh first slide will be uh, because I'm going to use the crystal uh crystal this part tool that's going to be tool I'm using. I'm not saying this is the best tool for that, uh, no, because uh, there is no best tool. Uh, this is the easiest for me to use. I'm going to use this, and you're going to use the portal and the metrics in the portal. There is a better tool that is definitely, but it's more complicated. You need to set up everything and uh, to make your, uh, it's not better tools. So again, it's, right, it's the wrong expression. It's uh, you can create, you can create an environment and a process to your uh, workload. You can use the, uh, DEA to replicate the workload and then uh, using the counters in the back and measure your throughput, whatever. There is a million options back. So the particular this one, you will see that I have a uh, sequential reads and random reads and random reads of 4K. Those 4K do not really measure SQL survives because uh, you know it, SQL server reads in 64K and usually. <laughs> So SQL Server store stuff in 8K and 64K groups, which is a 64K extent. So this text te test is not exactly represent represents the SQL Server I pattern, but it's really easy. Push the button and see how your drive behaves. Change the caching, do it again, and compare the values. Uh, but bear in mind that most of the storage vendors perform their IOPS measurements using the 4K. It's 
same. This is a group. But for this particular CDM, you can actually uh, change that. So the first one is uh, uh, sequential operations. You can see here. Uh, sequential operations and the random operation. This is the closest to active multi server. It's a random small operation, so to speak. So uh, we're going to talk here uh, about uh, uncached, it is cached throughput. So we have a premium disk, 2P30, simple stripe. So it's stripe across simple resilience, stripe across uh, storage space. One terabyte each, that's a two terabyte. Max is 10,000 because 5,000 each. Throughput is 400 because 200 each. We have 64K, interleave is 64K, uh, for location side interleave, and we have two columns. Everything is supposed to be. Azure VM max uncached, uncached with 20,000 IFS 500. Uh, what we are seeing here, we see 400 for sequential here, is hitting the head cap of your drive. This, this is uncached. Same thing, random as well. You can see it's uh, 40, you can't quite calculate there because we already talked uh, uh, less throughput, more IFS, less uh, size, so on, so on. Same here, this is cached. So again, the drive is still on 400, but the VM max is 800 now. And it's hitting the throughput 800. This is the cap now, this is cached. So you see there is a quite a big difference and the random is even more, this one. So this is the host caching read only, enabled on this side. And you can see quite a big difference. Let's see the same example for IOPS. So, now we're not looking at throughput, we're looking for IFS. IFS is 10,000 for those three drives because each has 5,000. You can see here it's uh, 20,000 for a VM limit. We are, we are having 20,000, but we have a disk cap here. Look at the random, is actually hitting that. And this is the IOPS you can see here. As well, on the second one, uh, when we enable it read, read only cache, that goes to, it goes to 80,000. And we are hitting that 80,000. Now is a, is a VM capping. So the first example is this capping, the second example is this capping. But this doesn't necessarily mean you have an issue. It depends on your workload. Maybe you're never going to reach this value. So, and this is not exactly 64K, as I said, it's 4K, and the first one sequential is even higher than that. So this is a default for uh, for uh, this this work, but it's just an example how much you can get with the read-only cache enable. This is the additional option you have on the CDM. It's actually the peak performance and the mix. So you can go on a profile, go on a profile, and uh, check the peak performance. There is other options you can see. Peak performance, uh, you can actually specify just the read, just the write, or a mix. I'm using the mix and peak performance, but you can use any of those. So, uh, and this is additional option. You can uh, set up actually the, your size, your queue, your uh, number of threads. Uh, for a sequential, for random, I put the 64K, we closest what we are using here, and I run the test. And uh, you can see the latency on this one. This is the last one is latency. The third one is I have. And this is the random sequential. But latency 2.2, that's really fast. For read, you usually have those things because this is microseconds just very much. Uh, really fast. Uh, for read, you know that uh, one, two millisecond latency is really good. If you go below that, that's exceptionally good. But uh, I don't know too many systems actually uh, having such a good latency. Maybe with the ultra drives, it's uh, something, yes, you can do. This is an example using the Azure portal metrics. It's a uh, it's host caching to none. Here I would just specify uh, what I used. I use the premium disk cache read bus. So that means if you miss your cache, you're not using, you're not reading from it. And that's a percentage. The sec second one is premium disk cache read hit. So if you that's that's a green one, and you can see on the slide here there is no green color whatsoever. So basically, it's not reading because the cache is disabled, so it's none. It's not reading from a host caching. It's reading from a drive. And then you have like just those disk read operations and uh, bandwidth of consumed uh, cache 
consumed and uncached consumed bandwidth. Those kind of things can kind of differ because um, those metrics, when you're getting those values below, it's actually calculating that time frame because it's in that single time frame uh, or during the monetary period. Uh, it can show the different values, so you kind of need to pinpoint uh, when you're doing something, testing something, you kind of need to show. I put a little bit more than I should, but this is just uh, uh, for presentation purposes. For this grid, this, this grid operations per second, there is a different types. You can go with this grid operations per second, which is actually uh, from the disk, per disk from the disk during the monitoring period. Then you have a data disk grid operations per second. That's a single data disk. And you have always this grid operations per second for operating system. So you need to understand those things and be careful uh, how you interpret and what you do. In this case, it's it's more than visible. You uh, you're reading uh, there is a cache miss more place uh, than uncached uncached bandwidth. Uh, it's 99% cache miss, 100% and zero zero for a cache uh, cache values. This is a different example. It's read only cache enable, and you can see that uh, green one, which is the cache hit, is the max, and the cache bandwidth is eighty percent. You still have that uh, uncached bandwidth, but as I said, you can see that's dropping slowly. As a way with the, if we shorten this period to exact when we change and test the, because I use the, I, I use the, uh, uh, I use the uh, for this one particular one when I was testing. I was running. The the transfer, the traffic data drive, and then checking what's happening. And bear in mind that uh, you you need to have a, a kind of warm up caching for this because you need to put something in the cache to be usable and reused. So here you can see everything is uh, mostly is from a cache. This green is really green, one hundred percent, and uh, yeah, it's telling us that uh, if you do this, if you enable this read-only cache. Uh, it's going to boost your performance. This is the summary of it, the whole session. Before, before we, because this is the last slide, the next one is a Q and A. But before we, uh, before we go with this one, I just want to say if uh, there is anything not uh, you guys don't understand uh, completely, or you have any any questions whatsoever, please just uh, send me the email or or contact me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm more than willing to help you if I can, definitely. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, let's let's wrap it up. This this is the most common storage and the VM size configuration recommendation. So, look. Besides this, you still need to you still need to set up your uh, uh, file initialization, max up uh, cost threshold, uh, enable lock pages in memory, and so on, so on. All those things you usually do. For your SQL setup on dedicated machine, you still need to do on the VMs here. There is no difference with that. But what we talked about today is about uh, uh, how to set up your drives, how to set, how to choose your size, how to understand your IOPS you have or current one, how to replicate it. Because you can't go with the CPU. You can't say, okay, I'm using the 16 CPU dedicated one. I'm going to go with the CPU for the the VM because it's not equal. Trust me, it's not one to one because uh, uh, threads and so on. I don't want to go deep to that, but there is a difference. Uh, you can relate throughput, of course. You can relate hives, of course. So first of all, use the memory optimizer with your machine size. It's the best performance for any SQL workload, especially for intense workload. Uh, then I always and always suggest use the marketplace images because it's going to do some stuff for you if you don't know how to set up that interleaves, the set up the location to separate those drives, put the column number and so on. Use this. It's going to be much easier. It's going to do everything for you. Place data, log, and TMDB files to separate drives. That's really important. For the data drive, use the P30, P40. I'm using those two. I'm happy with that. Cache support enable available, so that's really important as well. For a log drive, go with P30. Try if sub millisecond storage latest is required. Use the ultra disks. I'm talking about LDF here. In case M series, you can consider the right accelerator over the ultra disk because again, ultra disks are not cheap. But you need to see the price of M series and then compare what you want to have. 
Because with those risks, you really get the ballistic latency. Place TMDB on local ephemeral, ephemeral drive. So this is locally attached SSD. It's, uh, as I said, be careful. It's TMDB only. Don't put any drives into here. And, uh, because once the allocate is going to be gone from here. But you need to choose the proper VM size to have this option. Try to multiply Azure dri these drives to increase IO bandwidth. So I said, like, you have 3 P30. You're going to have 555. That's 15,000. You're going to have 200, 200, 200 bandwidth uh, for a. 600 and the size is going to be, of course, if it's stripe, it's going to be three times what they're for. Uh, set host caching for read only for the data file disk. Set host caching to none block file disk. Only in case if you have uh, uh, M series and uh, write acceleration, use the none plus uh, write accelerator. Format your da uh, data disk to 64K allocation size. Don't believe it needs to be the same as our size of 64 and 64. And you need to have the proper number of columns to utilize all the drives belonging to that storage pool or virtual drive behind the storage pool. And that's really important. If you miss those number of columns, you, you're not going to utilize all those drives. So if you add later on, let's say use the imaging uh, from uh, from marketplace, you create that VM, but later on you add the drive. It's not going to be part of those column numbers. You still need to. Add the storage pool to your uh, storage space, virtual drive, and uh, create all that to be available for your uh, OS. Uh, this is the all. Uh, this is the Q and A. Uh, not sure if uh, is there. If you can help me with this, uh, if there is any questions or anything like that.